There is a second story of divine transformation in the New Testament, and arguably a more important one than the story of crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus that comes immediately to mind. And that is the story of the demise of the fierce persecutor Saul and his restoration as the saintly super-apostle Paul. In this happening, Saul doesn't actually die, of course, but his old self is utterly traumatised by a roadside encounter with the god Jesus. Like Jesus, Saul is transformed into his new self after three days in darkness. Guided by those he would have persecuted, Saul re-emerges as Paul, the Lord's chosen vessel to carry his name before the Gentiles. The man from Tarsus goes on to establish the theology and structure of a religion never put in place by Jesus himself. The authorised story of the Christian church would be very different without Paul. And this wondrous transformation event is celebrated as the Road to Damascus Epiphany, a byword for any dramatic change of belief or direction. As an historical reality, however, the episode is a complete fabrication, as the next few minutes will reveal. Paul is first introduced into the story as the young man Saul, who witnesses the stoning of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Saul only minds the coats of the executioners, but he approves of the murder. The year this happened is often suggested to have been 34 AD, or thereabouts, not long after the crucifixion. On the very day of the martyrdom of Stephen, a great persecution of the church began and the brethren were scattered. But that dispersal also allowed the faith in Christ to be spread widely. Meanwhile, Saul has become a hot-headed Jewish zealot and spearheads the persecution. He obtains a warrant from the chief priest to descend on the city of Damascus and drag back to Jerusalem Christian heretics. But of course, those arrests never happen because as he approaches Damascus, Saul is enveloped by a light from heaven, falls to the ground and hears the voice of Jesus. The Lord tells him to go into the city for further instructions. And for the moment, Saul has lost his sight. While Saul waits, the Lord approaches a disciple in Damascus called Ananias, who he instructs to find Saul in the house of Judas in a street called Straight, and there to lay hands on him to restore his sight. Saul is filled with the Holy Spirit. He is baptised by Ananias grows in strength and amazes and confounds the Jews of Damascus by proclaiming Jesus to be the Son of God. The angry Jews plot to kill him and his disciples aid Paul in his escape at night by lowering him from the wall in a basket. And thus the super-apostle Paul is born, returning to Jerusalem to join the apostles and begin his illustrious career as the greatest of all evangelists. Well, that's the fairy tale, but let's deconstruct this pious fabrication. We can pass over the trivial Minding Coats introduction of Saul. Jewish law actually required the victim to be undressed, not the executioner's but perhaps it was a hot day. But let's put the great persecution under the microscope. Tucked in at the end of verse 8-1 is an outrageous exception to the dispersal. The brethren all scattered, except, that is, the apostles. Are we really going to believe that Saul made havoc of the church, as the New Testament claims, entered every house and dragged off the fans of Jesus, yet somehow overlooked the companions of Jesus and the leaders of the movement. 
There is, in fact, a very prosaic reason why the author of Acts slipped in that exclusion of the apostles. His story needed the apostles to be in Jerusalem for what comes next. The call for Peter and John to go to Samaria to deliver the Holy Spirit and for the whole gang to be in Jerusalem for Paul to join them when he returns from his away mission. Now it isn't difficult to conjecture a Saul who was a violently inclined fanatic. Religion has a nasty habit of creating such characters, willing to kill others as a requirement and vindication of their faith. But the more closely you look at the New Testament Saul, the more contrived does this character appear to be. He is simply overdrawn, especially when we consider other claims made for the same character. If Saul was such a violently inclined fanatic, why was he so hostile only towards those who followed a belief in Christ? Judaism had dozens of sects opposed towards the temple orthodoxy. In fact, it is very odd that when Paul converts and is sent back to Tarsus to escape those who would kill him, the supposed persecution of the church abruptly ends. Why on earth did Paul choose Damascus for his away mission? There is certainly no evidence of a Christian community in the city before the 4th century. Damascus was a key city on the long-distance trade routes and was a cult centre to the god Jupiter, every bit as important to the pagans as was Yahweh's temple to the Jews. It was one of the most important cities in the Roman province of Syria, but it was over 150 miles away at a time before the Romans had built their network of roads. On foot, it would have taken a couple of weeks to reach, and even on horseback, it was around a week away. Could Paul realistically have expected to have brought back a chain gang of Christians, even if he could have found and captured them? A handful of emigre Jews with some newfangled god called Jesus would have easily lost themselves in the city. The warrant of the Jerusalem high priests would not have been compelling in that distant polytheistic city, even among the Jewish community, and in any event, Acts says that Ananias was greatly respected by all the Jews, so evidently the Jews of Damascus had no issue with the fans of Jesus. But of course, all of these issues are of no consequence because the author of Acts knew perfectly well that his hero would never actually complete his arrest mission. Notice how the original short and simple dialogue between Saul and the Lord is enhanced in later versions of the text, remarkably with Jesus quoting a Greek proverb. If we ask where did this most important epiphany occur, there is no certain answer. It is delightfully typical with Christian holy sites that there isn't and there never has been any agreement among rival factions as to where any supposed holy happening really occurred. Paul's encounter with the Lord is no exception, and several venues in the vicinity of Damascus have been claimed for his light and sound show. The Greek Orthodox Church states a claim to Korkab, about 12 miles west of Old Damascus, which has the merit of being on the Old Damascus to Jerusalem road, and was the site chosen in the 12th century by Crusaders for a suitable shrine to Paul. Not to be bested by the Orthodox, Catholics defend the site of their own sanctuary, which is less than a mile from the walls of the city. It is an option supported by the reports of Catholic pilgrims from the early Middle Ages. Devout Catholics just knew where Paul had fallen off his horse. Other places, Daraya and Kizwa among them, have also been argued for. 
a non-existent event can obviously be located anywhere. Consider the importance in the story of Ananias, whose role in the transformation of Saul is critical, but who is never heard of again in the New Testament, not even in Paul's own letters. Rather odd, almost as odd as Ananias having a vision within a vision of a future event. Today, there is a street called Straight in Damascus, but there wasn't in the first century. The thoroughfare acquired the name during the Christian era between the 4th and 8th centuries, when the Temple of Jupiter was seized by the Christians and converted into the Church of John the Baptist. But for the Romans, all streets were straight, and the road through the centre of the city was the Decumanus Maximus. The author of Acts wasn't referring to an actual local road, but was echoing the words of John the Baptist, make his path straight, and Paul's baptism follows. Finally, there comes the famous escape of Paul from the city. But why? Quite bizarrely, the New Testament has two contradictory stories here. In Acts, the local Jews are in a murderous rage at Paul's new Christian self, though they had, as we've seen, all respected the Christian Ananias. But in 2 Corinthians, slipped in at the end of a section of Paul boasting of his suffering, is one of only two references to Damascus made by the Apostle. And here, Paul claims that in Damascus, he was escaping not the Jews, but the ethnarch, that is, a local governor, under King Aretas, that is, the king of the Nabataean Arab. If that were not contradiction enough, in Galatians, in the only other reference made by Paul to Damascus, he maintains that after his revelation, he didn't escape from Damascus, but returned to to Damascus and spent the next three years there. Did the Jews no longer want to murder him? Did Aratus no longer want to seize him? The whole episode is a fantasy of contradictions. It should be obvious to anyone that if Paul really was a bold and well-known evangelist, the place where he was residing could have easily been established and he could have been assassinated with a whole lot less trouble than guarding the entire city day and night. The escape was as symbolic as everything else in the Damascus episode. Think about it. Would a young man who had the energy to conduct house-to-house -house searches in Jerusalem and drag men and women off to prison really need to escape by basket? Look at the example set by the prostitute Rahab when she helped not one but two Hebrew spies escape Jericho. No basket was required. Did the Nabataean king ever control Damascus? Yes, for a few years in the early 1st century BC, before the arrival of Rome, when Aratus III was able to take advantage of the waning authority of the Seleucid Greeks. But that was around a century earlier than Paul's supposed escapade, and was the high watermark of Nabataean power. The Nabataean kingdom was centred on Petra, 300 miles away, and like the neighbouring Jewish kingdom, found itself increasingly surrounded by the expanding power of Rome. Each kingdom was first reduced to the status of a client state, paying tribute. The two kingdoms continued to fight minor wars with each other, even as they were being swallowed. That process began under Pompey the Great in 64 BC. Pompey made Damascus his base in Syria and completely rebuilt the old Greek city. The Nabataeans suffered a blow during the time of Mark Antony, who took their Red Sea trade and gave its control to Cleopatra. They suffered a further blow when their Mediterranean port of Gaza, rebuilt by Pompey, was handed to Herod by Augustus. Herod's son Philip the Tetrarch ruled over 
a territory much contested between the Jews and the Nabataeans. But when Philip died in 34 AD, his lands reverted to the Roman province of Syria. Three years later, Caligula would reward the territory to the grandson of Herod the Great, Herod Agrippa. In 36 AD, Vitellius advanced his legions on Nabatea, an invasion halted only by the death of Tiberius. The Nabataeans provided auxiliary troops for Rome in the war with the Jews in 67. Thereafter, their wealth continued to dwindle as Rome diverted trade via both Egypt and the Euphrates, and the whole kingdom was finally annexed in the year 106. We thus see that at no point in the first century AD did Damascus fall into the hands of Aratus the king, and the New Testament story is a complete fantasy. And it may be that the author of Acts found his inspiration for Paul's road trip to Damascus in sectarian literature. The Damascus Covenant, found among the Dead Sea Scrolls at Qumran, is so named because it refers to the land of Damascus several times. Damascus is a cryptic name referring not to the city but to the place of exile, in this case the Judean desert. The text addressed a community that viewed itself as the true Israel, just as the Christians would. They are a remnant faithful to God. The covenant presents a short history and quotes from the book of Amos. God will remember his covenant with Israel and will preserve the faithful even in the time of trial. Therefore I shall take you into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord. Now as it happened, Stephen's 1200 word martyrdom speech also presents a short history and also makes the same point by quoting the identical verse from Amos, but the writer misquotes the prophet by substituting Babylon for Damascus. I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Reassuring? Maybe. Inspirational? Perhaps. But it isn't true, it isn't history, it's more astounding rubbish.